Uh, I just want to share with you the joy of today that sometimes God like confirms uh, what he wants to say to his people in so many small, tiny things, but actually this is very encouraging. Actually, I prepared the talk of today from the, uh, the Pauline epistle, and uh, I was thinking, um, is it the, the real message, Lord, that you want to send your people? And I was asking this in my heart, and actually when I was just standing, uh, uh, Ahmed uh, came and, uh, and said, uh, can you please read the Pauline epistle? So I got the confirm that this is the message of today. So the message of today is from the, uh, um, from the book of Hebrews, the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Hebrews. And um, actually, I saw in this passage that God was angry with his people. And this is quite an amazing thing. God loves his people. God encourages his people. But in this epistle, God is showing an angry attitude towards his people. And uh, actually God said, according to what the Apostle Paul said, God was angry with that generation. What generation, Lord, that you are angry with? This is the generation of the Jews who went out of the land of Egypt and they were led, they were led by Moses just to enter the promised land, the land that is flowing. And Apostle Paul is the Hebrew person who is quite diligent in the law and he understood quite well in the law because he was a scholar, he was a big scholar in the, uh, in the law. So he understands what he's saying when he reflects from the Old Testament. Actually, uh, the Apostle Paul taught us how to see the Old Testament in the eyes of the New Testament. And he made so many precious reflections from the Old Testament. So in this reflection, he is reflecting to the people who went out of the land of Egypt just to enter into the promised land. And he said clearly that those people who went out of Egypt just to go to the land of Canaan, they didn't enter, finally, after 40 years, passing this horrible way. They couldn't enter. Only two persons entered the promised land, Caleb and Joshua. And all those who uh, left Egypt couldn't enter. Why, Lord? This is a big question. Why did you lead your people out of the land of Egypt and you promised them with something that is great? And then they fail. You couldn't accomplish your promise to your people. Why? The Apostle Paul is saying in a very clear way, it is because of the unbelief. So we are now actually facing a big problem. You know, the point or the issue of faith is the fuel of the journey. If we fail in this, we'll not be able to accomplish the journey. And the Apostle Paul, in more than one uh, 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 area of the, of the New Testament, his epistles, is reflecting on the people of Israel who left Egypt. He's just saying these are the, the Christians of the New Testament who start the journey with Christ. And actually, some of them enter and some don't. And this makes God the, the loving or the, the, the philanthropy, the lover of mankind, actually is very angry because he prepared all what is needed for the journey. And he prepared that, that high destination for God's people. If we fail it, he is so sad, he is so angry because he, he did everything for us to reach the goal and we fail him, and we fail ourselves even. So the talk of today is focused on this uh, uh, title, The Three Levels of Faith. Three Levels of Faith. So the Apostle Paul is actually reflecting on those people. And if you read the, uh, this part, you can go over it again. 
uh, this part of the uh, epi epistle to the Hebrews, you will find that all these elements are there. So let's... Uh, uh. So let's start the journey together in a few minutes to see how the journey could be a very fulfilling and exciting journey. This is the journey of faith. So, of course, we need to know it and we need to go through it. Not only know it, not only understand the idea, but actually this is the practical living of the Christian. So let's start with the first level of faith. So the first level was clearly the Exodus. When uh, God led his people out of the land of Egypt. I'm just putting some bullet points here just to, to, uh, uh, to go quickly on this, uh, on each and every point. So let's start with the first one. What is the, uh, the obstacle for going out of Egypt? Actually, there was so many huge obstacles. The biggest one was the king, the pharaoh who took a very fierce stand against their exit from Egypt. And he said, no, they are my slaves. I will not let them go in a very clear way. So Pharaoh was the first obstacle. And Pharaoh was actually backed by his army, which was at that time the strongest army in the world. So the army was so uh, uh, so strong. And the army had uh, 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 one of the weapons, it's referred to so many times in the, in the book of uh, Exodus, which are the chariots of Egypt. It's like one of the most recent like, weapons in, the, uh, uh, in our world today. So the chariots were undefeatable. So Pharaoh, the army, the chariots, and the biggest obstacle that we know, after they were like hindered from going out of Egypt because of the Red Sea was before them and Pharaoh with his army was uh, chase, uh, chasing them actually and they were locked in this situation. So the Red Sea, another obstacle. See how many obstacles. If we reflect this on our spiritual life, who's Pharaoh? Of course he is, as all the father, father said, he is Satan, he's the enemy of mankind. He wants to keep each and every one of you in his bondage all the way. He doesn't let us go and worship God. And yes, he has chariots, yes. And the Apostle Paul is reflecting on this in the epistle to the Ephesians chapter 6, when he just exposed the battle with this evil one. So these are the obstacles. Whose battle is this? In the first phase of faith, the battle is the Lord's. God said this in a very clear way. When Moses was crying to God on behalf of his people, Lord, what to do? We are locked. And the enemy said, as we say in the, uh, in the praises, I will pursue I will go over them. I will defy the spoil. I will control them again. I will bring them back. The enemy had so many high dreams of again keeping God's people in his bondage. But the Lord said to Moses, the, the, the battle is mine. The Lord will fight for you. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight in this very first battle of faith, which is, we can say it like, the, uh, uh, the, the, the faith of, uh, of the first step with God, the faith of salvation or the initial salvation. It is not our, our, uh, like our, uh, our role here. What was the role of God's people? Uh, the, 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 the remaining part or the, the second part of the verse, Exodus 14, 14, it says, and you shall hold your peace. This is not your battle. You cannot do it. And actually Christ did it on the cross when he defeated the evil one and brought him under the foot of the church. 
So it is God's battle. And this is the good news. The first level of faith is needed. Just believe in me. Just have faith in my salvation. And this is quite enough for the starting point of the journey. You will get out of the land of Egypt. What God need from a sinner person like me, at the very first step, nothing. Just receive what I offer you. That's enough for you. So uh, the salvation here, we can say that the first level of faith, salvation here, is, as we say in Exodus, as it said in Exodus 3, 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the land of Egypt. So this is the salvation in its first stage. Out of the land of e Egypt. What is the meaning of that practically? This is out of the land of the enemy. Out of the land of sin. So when we start our journey, and the fathers usually refer to this as the quickening of the heart. When your heart starts to quicken inside you, that, yeah, Lord, I want you, I need you. I know that I am I'm quite away, I'm far from you, Lord, and I want to get near to you. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, and this is actually of the, the outreach of the church. When the church, when the servants in the church, they just outreach those who are away from God, and they lead him to the first stage of salvation, which is knowing him, knowing Christ, knowing the salvation of God, knowing the cross, knowing the love of God, and knowing the good, the good news of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the Bible. So in this way, we start our first level of faith, accepting this salvation and actually saying, yes, Lord, we want to be your people. We will obey you. So this is the joy of salvation, and actually it is uh, actually the taste of the joy of salvation. It is there in each and every one of the children of God, and it is unforgettable, actually. So uh, what is the second level? After going out of Egypt, we go to the second level of faith, which is actually the journey in the wilderness. And this is the whole issue of the great land that we are going to, uh, to enter within uh, a few days. So the second level, this is this level of the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness? Pharaoh is gone. The army, no more. Chariots, drowned. The Red Sea, divided. And they, 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 they crossed that. No Red Sea, no obstacles of the past. So what's your problem, O oh people of God? Ooh, this is one of the biggest problems in the life of a believer. The inside Pharaoh. Oh, I left Pharaoh. And actually Pharaoh is drowned. But I see in myself another big giant that is actually facing and chasing me all the time, all the day. This is the battle of the wilderness, the inner Pharaoh, the old man that is inside you and inside me. And it says in this, clearly in Romans, the epistle of the, to the Romans, uh, chapter 6, verse 6. This is the, our old man. The apostle Paul says the old man. So the old man is actually an enemy, an obstacle in the wilderness. And dealing with the old man is the whole issue about the wilderness. Why did God like, lead them in the wilderness? Why did God don't, didn't at that time like, lead them out of Egypt, back to back, to, to the land of Canaan, by passing this hard time? You see, God couldn't do that because you have to face the inside Pharaoh. So what are the trials of the wilderness? Actually, the trials of the wilderness is what Jesus faced in the wilderness. He faced those kinds of trials. And I'm just squeezing, summarizing them in the three big trials that the enemy just uh, tested Jesus with. The first thing, physical needs. The food, you're hungry. The foods, your physical needs. Your biological needs. 
This is one of the enemies that you have to face it in the wilderness. And I'm leaving all these talks or these points or the details of these points to the time of Lent. Of course, you will hear a lot more about that. So this is the first enemy that you have to face in the wilderness inside you. What's the second one? When the enemy uh, uh, came to Jesus and said, oh, you can uh, um, like throw yourself from the pinnacle of the temple so they can see you flying in the air and the angels carrying you and they will know at that time that you are the Christ. Isn't that a good idea? To declare yourself as the Christ, the redeemer of your people? And what did Jesus say? No. No. This is actually the test of the ego and, uh, and the vain glory. When you do like that, you will get the vain glory. People will glorify you. Is this the glory of God? My beloved, this is our daily struggle against the vain glory, against the ego that is hurting you and me, hurting and hindering all of us and making the conflicts because the ego, of course, will collide with one another. You will collide. The ego cannot get in harmony because I want my ego and the other person sitting beside me wants his or her ego. So, of course, we'll get in trouble. This is the time of the wilderness when you should deal with the ego. You should deal with the vain glory. And you should come to a conclusion that never to test or never to try the, the, the God of my salvation. I will refuse this from your hand, O oh Satan, the evil one. So, this is the second one in the, in the wilderness. What's the third a trial in the wilderness. He showed him the, all the authorities, all the kingdoms, and everything in the world. And he said, I will give you all this. All the kingdoms of the earth will be yours. All the kings of the earth will submit to you if you just bow to me. So this is, I can just say that this, the name of this trial is the power, authority, controlling others. And again, this is one of the biggest trials of mankind. We seek authority. We love it. We lean for it. We actually, we seek authority all the day long. Authority through so many things. But you see, Christ didn't accept again that offer from the hand of the, the, enemy, the enemy. So what did Jesus say? Get away, get behind me, O oh Satan. So Jesus rebuked Satan at this trial. And this is showing to us that the trials in the wilderness are not easy. Because the enemy, Satan, actually is using our weaknesses, our old man. And this is the fight, this is the struggle that the Apostle Paul is describing in a very detailed way in Romans chapter 7. The, the, the fight between the new man, the new start in Christ, your new life with Christ, your, your new life in, uh, in the church and being a, a, a person who is like, uh, who, who wants God, who wants God to be your, your king. And the old man. Here, salvation at this point is from the impact of my old life. So you will see here, Pharaoh is gone, but another Pharaoh inside me is there. So the Pharaoh that is inside me is just the, the imprint of that old Pharaoh that I was submitting to in the past. So you will see that these are your weaknesses that are over and over and over in the wilderness. So here, I just made it in red so it is very clear to you. And it, you can like meditate on this. Salvation here is from the impacts of Pharaoh on their souls. That's why God permitted this time in the wilderness, 40 years, Lord, 
that's, that's long, that, that's too long. Actually, it, is not, it was not intended to be 40 years, but because of their own stubbornness, because of their, uh, 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 their, uh, uh, their refusal, actually, to, to obey and to be in harmony with God. And whatever it takes, God is preparing that time to deal with your old self. And again, to restore the likeness of God. You see that we were created with two qualities, in the image of God and after his likeness. This is uh, there in the book of Genesis. In the image of God and after his likeness. See the fathers, the early fathers, they usually uh, 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 interpret this verse in this way. They say that the image of God is what is inside you. And it is not destroyed. It, maybe it is marred, yes, weakened, yes, by sin and by the fall. But it, actually it is not destroyed. And this is the huge difference between uh, salvation in the orthodox way and salvation in uh, maybe in the reformation way. When they say that, said that the image of God is destroyed, man is dead, cannot do anything, no. In the orthodox understanding, according to the fathers, they say that the image of God is imprinted even in the heathens. And this makes the heathens sometimes they do very merciful acts because the image of God is in them, in each and every one of humankind. But the likeness, no. This is the way that you have to go through from the image to the likeness, which is actually being like Christ. And this is what the Apostle Paul again says in Romans 8, to be like Christ. This is the way of salvation, and this is the goal of the time of the wilderness. How? I'm leaving this to the time of the great land. You will hear a lot about the time of the wilderness. And actually, this third level of faith, which is now entering the promised land. See, I want to read with you the promise of God who led them out of the land of Egypt. Why? I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a land flowing with milk and honey. So don't stop at the level of going out of Egypt. Pharaoh is gone. I'm doing my best with my inner Pharaoh. And that's it. That's life. And we'll continue that without entering the promised land. We have to keep our faith ignited, moved all the time. So we don't stop at the first level or the second level. We have to pursue. We have to continue. What's the obstacle here? Actually, the obstacle is not inside you anymore. But it is the world around you with its prince of the world, the evil one, who is trying to, by external pressure, not internal pressures, external pressures, they try to fight the kingdom of God around you. And actually, this is the, the work of the Christian in his life. After finishing or after going a great deal of the battle of the wilderness, then you have to Stand as a man of God, as a woman of God, as a children of God, all of us. We stand against this world and, uh, the, the, uh, and its prince. Again, you will see that in, after the, the end of each Catholic epistle, you see these words. The church prepared these words to be heard over and over and over. Do not love the world or the things in the world. What's the goal of this uh, phase of faith? expanding the kingdom of God and spreading the good news. So this is your work. This is my work. This is actually our main task in the world. So your main task is not to, being, to, to be just a physician, an engineer, your job, whatever it is, just fulfilling your job and that's it. So you imagine that I lived such a good life. This is just to earn your living. But actually, the main goal of us Christians in this world 
is that to expand the kingdom of God, to preach the kingdom of God, to give the good news to the world, to change the world in the sense that we are the salt of the world. See, you are the salt of the earth. Salt of the earth, so we are giving the taste. We are preserving the world. We are preserving the earth so the evil one could not get control over it. And see, when the church is weak, in some ages, some generations, you see at this point, the enemy is taking control of the people and is actually uh, is giving uh, 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 the people a, a hard time because, you know, he is unmerciful. So the goal is expanding the kingdom of God. How can we do that? You and me being changed to the likeness of Christ. This is the way we can change the world around us. Being in the likeness of Christ. So, see how our fathers shaped their generations in the first, second, third, fourth centuries and afterwards. How did they shape the Roman Empire at that time, which was so strong with its rules and laws and, and philosophy and culture? They changed everything. How did they do that? Very simple thing. Being in the likeness of God, this is the challenge. This is what the saint said, Saint Seraphim of Serov. I love this saint. He always says that, fill your heart with peace and you will see thousands around you being saved. He's the one who said this, this uh, saying. Fill your heart with peace and you will see thousands around you will be saved. So being, again, changing in the likeness of God, this is the way. And you can see this in the battles of, the, uh, of faith. It's in, in the book of Joshua. How the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament expanded at that time. And they, 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 they actually they made the presence of God a reality in their time. In the book of Joshua, it is very clear. Battles of faith. The last thing, the last word I can leave with you. So we went through the three levels of faith. The first level of salvation, the exodus, getting out of the land of Egypt. Second level of faith, which is going through the wilderness with its struggles. Third level of faith, entering the, uh, uh, the promised land and doing the battles of faith and expanding the kingdom of God around you. What do we need? Faith needs obedience. See, who is the, uh, 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 the father of faith, as we say it in the, in, the, uh, in the Bible and in the church? Who is the father of faith? Who is Abraham, of course. I see some of you say Abraham, yes. So Abraham is the father of faith. Why did Abraham do? Actually, when Abraham was called, he obeyed. What did Jesus do? This is just a small verse from the uh, book of uh, the epistle to the Philippians. Obedient, it, 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 it talks about Jesus. Obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Believe me, this is the sign of faith. So faith is not an idea. Faith is not a concept. It's not a doctrine. Faith is tested by obedience, daily obedience to the commandment, obedience to God in the details, minor details of your life is showing your faith. Let's move from the first level to the second to the third one. This pleases God's heart. And this makes God not to be angry with our generation as he was angry to the people of God who left Egypt and actually failed to enter the promised land. May Jesus, may Christ, the author and finisher of faith, help each and every one of you. Let's focus on him, and he will lead us in the way of the saints as all the good people uh, of God, the saints, went through this way of faith at their time. And glory be to God forever. Amen.